Hi, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Marion from uh, Kingston Library and today we are really excited to uh, welcome Mike Siegel to talk about the history of Kingston Birth Name. Um, and this is part of the local uh, and community history months. Uh, so yeah, Mike, up to, up to you. <laughs> right, thank you very much, Marion. And good morning, everybody. Um, just to introduce myself a little bit further, uh, I've lived in Kingston for almost 36 years. Um, I am uh, now the Henri Tipstaff and town crier for the uh, Royal Borough, which I've been doing for the last uh, three years. And uh, I was a uh, Kingston tour guide for eight years and, and chair of that organisation. So uh, I know a little bit about the history, or I like to think I do, and I hope to share uh, my knowledge and enthusiasm for that history with you this morning. Uh, you see before you a uh, picture of the marketplace, uh, the famous centre, thriving centre of Kingston. And I should be talking about the various buildings that you see before you, the facade, the, the market house with the Queen Anne statue and the Shrubsill statue. But the history of Kingston, let's take it right back to the beginning. Because people say Kingston is where England began. And the reason uh, that Kingston has earned that title is because we know that uh, at least two out of the seven Saxon kings were crowned here uh, in the 10th century. And here you can see a print of the coronation stone uh, when it was re-inaugurated in Victorian times. Uh, our Victorian ancestors were very, very keen on the Saxon history and very keen to promote it as indeed we are again today. So there is the coronation stone, as you can see it now in front of the Guild Hall. Uh, it's a sarsen stone, similar to the stone of Schoon that's used at Westminster Abbey for the coronations right up to the present era. And underneath you see the names of the various Saxon kings, and I'm going to be talking about them very shortly. But first, the name, Kingston. Uh, whenever I take people around uh, the town, I often ask why they think the town has its name, Kingston. And most people get it wrong. It, it's not King's Town. Uh, it's actually the King's Tun, T-U-N. And that word means an estate. So the King's Tun, or Kingston, as it came to be known, was just the King's estate. It was a royal estate. Uh, several miles outside uh, London, as it came to be. But Kingston uh, was once an island. Uh, there was the Thames, the Hogs Mill, and the rivers went all the way round uh, this town. And it wasn't, of course, in England at the time, it was in Wessex. But that's in Saxon times. Uh, settlement here goes as far back as 5,000 years ago. Uh, discoveries have been made. Um, but there's no evidence of any Roman occupation. Uh, we know that Julius Caesar crossed the Thames uh, in his visit uh, to Britain in 55 and then in 54 BC, he crossed the Thames, uh, but that's more likely to be in, at Brentford and, and Kew rather than here in Kingston. The first actual mention of the town is in Saxon times in AD 838. That's the, the first date that we have of Kingston's existence. And this is because of a King Egbert council. Now, King Egbert is not somebody that most people know about. He was a king of Wessex. As I say, England hadn't yet been united as a country. There were seven different kingdoms uh, within what we now call England. And Wessex uh, was the largest in the South. Now, Egbert, as I say, is not very well known, but he was the grandfather of the much more famous King Alfred. And there's a picture of Alfred uh, on the right. But why Egbert uh, is well known in Kingston is because he called a council of bishops and nobles to discuss the Danish problem. The Danes or the Vikings were constantly threatening uh, England. Uh, they'd come very much uh, into the uh, for further north uh, in modern day uh, Northumberland, uh, causing great havoc, and they were coming further south uh, around the coast and causing problems uh, into our part uh, of the world. So Alfred, who later became called the Great, 
successfully fought against the Danes, but he ruled, say, only Wessex and the south of England. Yet he's the person that we know very much about. Um, Kingston lay on the river. It was a kind of border town between Wessex, which was really pretty much all of the area to the south uh, of the Thames and, and further west, and Mercia uh, was the kingdom which is sort of the modern day Midlands. Now, though Alfred is so well known, it was in fact his son and his grandson who did more actually to get rid of the Danes. His son, Edward the Elder, who is the first king that we think may have been crowned in Kingston, the first of a, a line of seven. Uh, he, the same, there's a quote from a, a historian uh, soon after, Edward was much inferior to his father in the cultivation of letters, but incomparably more glorious in the power of his rule. So as I say, though we, certainly when I was growing up, we all knew about King Alfred defeating the Danes and the story of burning the cakes and all of that, uh, he wasn't actually as good at getting rid of the Danes as his son and his grandson. And it was his grandson, Athelstan, uh, who has been uh, now uh, properly regarded as the first king of all England. And on the right there, uh, you will see uh, not a picture of Athelstan himself, but of yours truly dressed up as Athelstan. Uh, I've done that quite a few times now. You see me there standing in front of the, the coronation stone. Now, again, when I was growing up and a student of history, which I absolutely love, I confess I'd never heard of Athelstan. And it's only in the last 10, 20 years that quite a few books have been written about Athelstan and proving that he was the person who really did uh, deserve this title, first king of all England. And we in Kingston, if you like, own him because we know we have absolute proof that he was crowned at Kingston. He was a successful military commander. He removed the Danes from the country and therefore he got the respect uh, of all the other Saxon kings and they then bowed down to him. So he became very much sort of the head honcho and deserves this title, first king of all England. He was also a man of religion and of scholarship. He wasn't just a commander. And so he, as I say, is now regarded by modern historians as the first king of all England. Um, it didn't last beyond the next hundred years because the Danes came back, uh, but he very much deserves this title. And we in Kingston, I think, should be very proud of him. Now there is an actual uh, portrait, sorry, um, go back, a uh, portrait of Athelstan uh, on the left uh, with St. Dunstan, to say he was a man of scholarship and of religion. And on the right, uh, that is a picture of his crown, and you can see a replica of his crown uh, inside All Saints Church. Uh, there's a lot to see inside the church, which I'll describe in a few minutes. Um, now, moving on from Athelstan, to say there were a total of seven kings, um, Edward the Elder and Athelstan I've mentioned. Uh, the picture that you can see, uh, that's in Eden Street. Uh, that was put there in 1985. It's relatively recent. Um, in my view, and the view of many other historians in Kingston, it's rather too tucked away and it may possibly be moved uh, with new developments. Uh, but it's very spectacular. The upper half uh, has, or more than the upper half, but the upper section is the seven Saxon kings, and below uh, are various people, some named, some not, who lived in Kingston in Victorian times. Now, the other kings, I shan't be talking about them all. Uh, they share, except for Athelstan, uh, the letter E to begin them. Uh, the only other one I'll mention is the final king, Ethelred the Unready. Uh, he deserves uh, a reputation, perhaps uh, wrongly, uh, because he was the one who then was defeated by the Danes, the Vikings, when they came back. But already is unfortunate uh, because it's uh, a sort of mistranslation uh, of his proper nickname, which was Readless, which just means without advice, uh, and was mistranslated as unready. Uh, because he let the, the Vikings back in. It was thought he was ill-prepared, but actually it was more that he was ill-advised. 
uh, something we might think about when we think of modern day politicians, whether they're ill prepared or ill advised. But that was Ethelred. Anyway, where were these kings crowned? Uh, we know the, the stone, but where exactly was the stone? Well, it was probably inside or outside the Saxon chapel of St. Mary, uh, which preceded uh, All Saints Church. It was very close by. And if you uh, are by the church, you can see uh, on the ground, you can see little markers uh, where this um, chapel uh, existed. Um, there have been plans for the last few years to move the stone back to the churchyard. Uh, it would cost a lot of money. Um, there's been attempts to try and undo this. Of course, with the pandemic, everything's been put on hold, but perhaps one day uh, the stone might be moved from its present site by the Guild Hall uh, back to the churchyard. It would be more central to Kingston, particularly for people coming in into shop. Uh, there'd be more people who would actually view it. Now, when the Saxon chapel collapsed, as I say, in 1730, uh, it killed the then verger. And the lady on the right, who's very much a Kingston character uh, called Esther Hamilton, uh, she looks rather a fierce lady. Um, she took over as verger disguised as a man because in, in 1730, almost 300 years ago, uh, women weren't allowed to have any kind of position in the church at all. Though she dressed up as a man, she does look a little bit mannish, I'm allowed to say that, and to say she's very much a Kingston character. Now, 20 years after uh, the Battle of Hastings and William the Conqueror, uh, he set up the Doomsday Book uh, in 1086, uh, which mentioned every place uh, in England at the time. And Kingston is mentioned in that Doomsday Book as having three fisheries, and the symbol of the three salmon fish uh, is uh, the symbol of Kingston to this day. It had five mills and a population, this might interest you, of 500, as well as the Minster Church. Now that Minster Church was still the Saxon Church, and it wasn't until a little later in the Norman period uh, that the church was rebuilt. All Saints dates back, say, to the Norman period, uh, begun in 1120 in the reign of Henry I, so almost 60 years after the Normans had first arrived. Many additions over the years, right up to the Victorian period. And if you look at the photograph there of the bell tower, you see the clear distinction between the bricks at the, the top and those underneath, uh, which are very much older and go back to the medieval period. Now, inside the church, there's a great deal to see. And if you haven't been into All Saints recently, and particularly now everything's opened up again, I thoroughly recommend a visit. Um, a few years back, it, it was refurbished. Um, it, it's very much a multi-purpose building. It is, of course, a place for religious worship, but it, it's like a museum. There's a great deal about the history, and there's a, there's a cafe there. They host talks. Uh, it is a very good venue indeed. There's this beautiful stained glass that you can see. You learn a lot about the Saxon kings and where England began, but you also can read a lot about the later periods. St. Blaise, I'm going to talk about in a minute, my favorite little bit within the church. Various statues of all sorts of people uh, connected with Kingston over the years. A tribute to the war dead from the, the world wars, but particularly the First World War. Um, the organ is Danish, uh, something I think rather ironic when you think back to the Saxon period and fighting against the Danes. Uh, this was a gift from the Danish government uh, in the early part of the 20th century. And going back into the very beginning of the 20th century, there's a particular commemoration when King Edward VII, uh, his coronation in 1902 uh, was said to be exactly a hundred years after the coronation of Edward the Elder supposedly in Kingston. So there's a great deal of history uh, inside the church that you can see and read about. Now St Blaise who I mentioned, uh, so this is my favourite part of the church because it's very old indeed. Um, now who was St Blaise? He was an Armenian 
uh, a Christian who lived around 300 CE or AD, uh, and he was martyred uh, in a rather horrible way. He was beaten, uh, attacked with iron cones, and then beheaded. Very nasty indeed. And you can see in that picture of him uh, on the wall, uh, you can see the, the sort of iron cone there. And that's what was used to attack him, to, to flay his skin. Horrible story. But this makes him the patron saint of wall combers. And that's why it's of particular interest that he's associated with the church and with Kingston, because at this time in the Middle Ages, uh, the wool trade was extremely important within the town. Um, the whole of the south of England was trading very well uh, with Europe uh, in selling our sheep across to Europe and bringing a great deal of money back uh, into the country and to Kingston in particular. Now, talking of the economy and markets, uh, coming to the marketplace, my very first picture, this is the focal point of Kingston. I have to admit, I'm slightly amused that it's always referred to now as the ancient marketplace. Uh, to me, ancient is sort of Greece and Rome and you know the period BC. Uh, the ancient marketplace is really a medieval market. Uh, it dates back to the reign of Henry II uh, in the 12th century. Uh, we can't date it exactly. Um, it's sometime very similar to when the first bridge was built, which I'll talk about shortly. Some people think the market came first and therefore the bridge was built. Others think because the bridge was built, therefore the town uh, became uh, more approachable because people could transport things and the market developed. But this is one of the oldest markets uh, in London and said to be uh, the best laid out market of all the London boroughs. And it certainly, as I say, it's very much the central part of our town. Now, was there a Kingston Castle uh, around which the market developed? Certainly in other parts of England and indeed other parts of Europe, uh, markets did develop around castles. And of course, if you know Kingston, there is Castle Street. This is much disputed. Um, there is a website uh, which is described as the comprehensive gazetteer of medieval castles who claims that it was, and further it says that it was captured by King Henry III in 1264 in the war against the barons. Now, there's no proof of this, uh, so it's a matter of some dispute, but I think it, it's of some interest, and certainly uh, it's a puzzle as to why we have a castle street if there was no castle. Now, continuing with history and certain kings, uh, something we very much do have, uh, too many people just walk past it without looking up to it unless it's pointed out to them, what I call the royal facade. Um, this was originally Boots, uh, Jesse Boot, who started the, the chemist uh, in, in Nottingham and then in London, uh, was a great uh, historian himself, had a lot of interest. And when he opened his store in Kingston, uh, together with the then mayor, a man called Finney, uh, they decided to have this facade. It looks very medieval. In fact, it belongs to the early 20th century and to depict some key points of uh, the history of the town. Um, it then long since has, has not been boots. Uh, it became next, Jack Wills, and it's changed again recently to a shop called Anthropology. The Queen's grandfather, George V, visited uh, the borough in 1927 and reaffirmed that this was a royal borough, and that can all be seen on this facade. And around the facade, there are uh, the six monarchs, Edward the Elder and Athelstan, uh, two of the Saxon kings I've mentioned, and then King John, Henry III, Edward III, and Elizabeth I. A few words about each of them and why they are important to Kingston. Firstly, King John. Well, we all know about bad King John, who was forced to sign the Magna Carta in 1215 at Runnymede, uh, but John liked his, his charters. Uh, he did, wasn't forced to, to writing them all, only, only that one. 
and we know that he gave a charter to Kingston in 1200. Unfortunately, that one doesn't survive, uh, but there is one dated to 1208, and it survives, uh, it's in, in the Guild Hall. And this was issued by the king, fixing rent and granting the town freedom to administer much of its own affairs. So this is the king giving Kingston uh, you know, independence, if you like, to, to, to govern itself to a large extent. Now, when John died, uh, his son Henry was only nine years old. John, uh, as we know, was very unpopular, and there had been a move to bring in the French to rule. Uh, but a year later, uh, after his death, there was a treaty of Kingston agreed on Ravens 8, uh, the little island, which uh, now hosts sort of weddings and other celebrations. Uh, and this treaty was made with Prince Louis of France, who was going to be imported uh, to take over the Kingdom of England, enabling young Henry uh, to reign. Now, uh, Henry reigned for a long time. He was only nine years old when he became king. And in 1256, he granted the town uh, more freedoms, which included an eight-day fair around the feast day of All Souls, uh, All Souls, All Saints, 31st of October, 1st of November. And to have eight-day fairs, this again is very good for the economy of the town. And it was Henry III, who I mentioned just now, uh, who some say captured Kingston Castle, if it existed, in 1264 in the war against the barons. Now the next king depicted is Edward III about a century later and he is important in Kingston because he called the town Kingston upon Thames rather than just Kingston and this was of course to distinguish it from the Yorkshire town of Kingston upon Hull. Now Hull is just known as Hull now Whereas we're more usually known as Kingston, not everybody puts in the upon Thames. And you may know that Hull has very recently been a city of culture, uh, which has brought it uh, uh, a bit more fame and uh, unfortunately hit by COVID. Uh, but there is an idea perhaps to make Royal Kingston a borough of culture. Whether anything will come of that, I don't know, but that has been mooted. And the final monarch depicted on the facade is Elizabeth I, uh, of course, one of uh, England's most famous monarchs, the Spanish Armada, etc. And she's the one who founded the grammar school uh, in Kingston in 1561. And our queen visited it on its 400th anniversary. Uh, and then again, more recently, uh, the queen has very often been to Kingston. I was fortunate enough to, to meet her on one of those occasions. Now also on the facade, there's some benefactors' crests, uh, Lovekin, so the Lovekin Chapel, uh, which belongs to uh, Kingston Grammar, so it, it's opposite on the other side of the road. Uh, a man called Hammond, who endowed Kingston Bridge uh, with 40 pounds a year in order to make it toll free. Uh, when Kingston Bridge uh, was uh, built, people had to pay a toll. Uh, to go across, and Cleve, who built the almshouses, uh, which are down the London Road. And on Heritage Weekends in uh, September, uh, you can go and visit. It's well worth a visit there. Now, punishment and news. Uh, the marketplace was very much a centre. This is not a picture of the marketplace, but the only one I could found, find of the sort of stocks. Uh, people would be put into such things uh, for minor punishments. Um, they have some rotten tomatoes and things uh, thrown at them. And the marketplace was also a centre for exchange of information and gossip. It's where people would gather and people would uh, make announcements there. Um, and I mentioned at the beginning, uh, I hold the office of Henri Chipstaff and Town Crier. And I, I mentioned this because this was very much where uh, these two positions, they were separate at one time, originated, they'd be around the centre of the town. The tip staff was more like uh, the forerunner of a policeman who might arrest people for doing the wrong thing, whereas the town crier would be making announcements, perhaps even announcing a curfew in times of plague, which there were, you know, telling people they had to go back home. Now, old buildings around the marketplace, 
uh, uh, there are several, I just mentioned a few. Um, if you look at that uh, photograph uh, to the left, uh, what was originally Bradford and Bingley became Santander uh, and has now been empty for quite some time, is actually one of the oldest buildings around the marketplace. Uh, it goes back to Tudor times, inside that there are beams, uh, and down the side you can see the, the Tudor mullioned windows. Um, the picture, uh, the building in, in the middle of the picture, uh, much, much later, beginning of the 20th century, uh, but very important, uh, became Millet, it's now called the Great Outdoors, but that was a very elegant shop and dining room, uh, in some regard as the sort of Portland and Mason uh, of Kingston, uh, built in the Dutch style, if you particularly look at the upper part, very reminiscent of buildings in Amsterdam. And of course it backed onto the river, so it's where the great and the good might go and dine, they could look out the river, or they could order their picnics to take on, on their boats. But the probably the oldest uh, building uh, is in the corner by those bicycles, uh, White Stuff. If you know that building, uh, that's thought to be probably uh, the oldest surviving building in the marketplace, uh, going back probably to the late 15th century. Now, inns. Uh, these were very popular indeed in medieval times. I've got quite a long list here. I'm not going to talk about them all. Uh, but the Rose, uh, this is uh, the shop Hobbs. Uh, Ladies of the audience might know Hobbs and go and buy their dresses there. Uh, if you look above, there are some Tudor beams there, very clearly visible. And what I think is quite interesting is that it was a valet who used to look after Henry VIII's handsome court, uh, that he did a little bit of moonlighting and he came into Kingston in the evenings uh, to sort of run the pub here. Now here's just a list of names. Just go through these. You can just see how many. Uh, pubs were just within the area of the marketplace itself. Uh, then as now people like to drink or indeed to get it to stay. And I'll be talking about that because Castle Inn, which is now Nat West uh, on the other side of the uh, uh, marketplace. Uh, this, if you like, was the posh side uh, because there were views of the river and there was room behind for horses to be stabled. Kingston was the first stop on the road from London to Portsmouth. Uh, so people would come here, perhaps for a very quick comfort stop and then be on their way again or for an overnight stay. And there'd be up to 50 coaches a day in the heyday of coach travel in the 17th, 18th century. And horses could be changed as quickly as two minutes. So enough for people say, to have their comfort stop and be on their way again if they were as it were on the express, but if they wanted to stay over, it would be places like the Castle Inn where they would stay. Of all those many pubs around the marketplace, the only one to survive is the Jury's Head. Um, it's changed its name. The Jury's Head sounds nice and old. It was originally the Lion and the Lamb. It provided the largest stabling area, even bigger than the Castle Inn, uh, with an entrance to the stable yard, and troops were often billeted here excise collectors, they would have been very popular, but more famously, Jerome K. Jerome, who wrote Three Men in a Boat, famous book, uh, which starts in Kingston and talks a lot about Hampton Court. Um, now, George Aylip was a Victorian diarist who, who lived in Kingston. He lived for uh, 90 years. There's the uh, picture again of the Saxon Kings and below I mentioned uh, various people uh, of Victorian times. Aylip's right in the middle, and I mention him here because he's got a good description of the Druid's Head. It was called the Druid's Head by then. It had one of the largest rooms available in the town, and at fair times it was used for dancing by hundreds of country folk. So this shows very much how the town was very much a centre uh, for people to come into, uh, as it is now for people coming to shop. Charles Dickens uh, was another writer who stayed in Kingston. Uh, he stayed at a pub called the Wheat Chief, which then became, until very recently, Ryman's. That branch of Ryman's has closed. I'm not sure what it's, it's going to become, but Dickens uh, did stay there. I'm sorry there isn't a blue plaque, but uh, we know he did. 
Uh, also in the marketplace, there used to be a, a, a football match every Shrove Tuesday. <clears throat> Unfortunately, uh, this uh, led to a lot of drunk or revelry and riotous behaviour, uh, so much so that it was eventually banned. But there's a good picture, I think, uh, of that uh, football match uh, with the market house behind. Now, what we call the market house was originally the town hall, which dates back to Tudor times. It was then rebuilt at the start of the 18th century in 1706 with a statue of the then monarch Queen Anne added at a cost, and we, we have this figure, 47 pounds, 18 shillings and sixpence. It doesn't sound very much to us 300 years later, but uh, a princely sum at the time. And there's the town hall today. Uh, it was uh, built, uh, rebuilt in 1838, uh, the statue of Queen Anne transferred, and it remained as a town hall for almost 100 years until the Guild Hall was built. Uh, now it's uh, the market house and the information center, and there are in fact various plans as to how it might be reused, particularly with changes proposed uh, to the Guild Hall. Now, Queen Anne, uh, having a statue here, I think we're, we're quite honored. There are very few statues of Queen Anne as opposed to Queen Victoria. Uh, Anne was the last Stuart monarch. She spent a lot of time nearby Hampton Court. So she very often came into Kingston, uh, but here is a, 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 another statue of Queen Anne in London in front of the Paul's Cathedral. But our own statue was recently regilded uh, in 2012 for the Olympic cycle race the same year, of course, as our own Queen's um, Diamond Jubilee. Now, the time of Queen Anne and onwards was very much a time of highwaymen uh, up and down the country, and Kingston was no exception. Another Kingston character was Jerry Abershaw, who was born in Kingston, uh, started a life of crime at the age of 17. Uh, he, uh, he led a gang which was for many years the terror of the roads between London, Kingston and Wimbledon, so the whole sort of area around Kingston Vale. Uh, eventually caught, brought to trial, and he was hanged uh, on Wimbledon Common. Uh, back into the marketplace and the Shrubsoul statue uh, in the center of the marketplace. Now, Henry Shrubsoul uh, was a businessman and entrepreneur. Uh, in fact, the NatWest Bank was originally Shrubsoul's bank. And Shrubsoul became mayor, but he died in his term of office, actually at a time when we, he was handing out tea uh, to selected poor people. And in honour of him, uh, this statue was put up, which also provided a practical purpose because it was a water fountain uh, at a time when not many homes had running water. But to commemorate uh, Mayor Shrubsoul's sudden death, there's a black link in the mayor's chain which uh, is used to this day so if you see uh, the mayor at any function uh, and you get close to the mayor if you look at the chain you'll see that one of the links uh, is black uh, in memory of Henry Shrubsoul. Now there's a passage named after Shrubsoul uh, this links the marketplace down to the river to Charter Quay and if you go along there uh, again, too many people just walk past without having a good look at it, but there's a lot of the history uh, of Kingston uh, in this passage on this plaque. There was a medieval footpath which linked the marketplace to the river, and now, as I say, it goes through to Charter Quay. And this uh, plaque was unveiled in 2003. Uh, that was the year after the Queen's Golden Jubilee, and so you've got all sorts of uh, little images of the history of Kingston, many of which I'm talking about, uh, that you can read about and see these pictures of. Uh, the artist John Richards, and it was various different historical organisations within Kingston uh, who organised that this should be put up there. Um, as well as that, the main market, there's the apple market, uh, where sheep were, were driven through. It's, uh, it, the, the passage narrows to, to contain these sheep. Now it's just the center for several coffee shops. Uh, the Memorial Gardens, where every year on uh, Remembrance Sunday, there, there, there's a service uh, where the, the mayor takes part, I'm part of that. 
uh, an impressive service, um, usually sometimes going on into All Saints Church, sometimes out in the open air. And there is the War Memorial uh, where the wreaths are laid. Uh, there are also a couple of interesting things about the gardens. Uh, there's the grave of a man called Joshua Clues, who fought at the Battle of Waterloo uh, in 1815, where Wellington, of course, defeated Napoleon. Uh, there's also the Anne Frank tree. Uh, this was the brainchild of a former mayor, um, uh, John Cunningham, who, who's in fact still a, a councillor, uh, who wanted to plant uh, a tree in memory of Anne Frank and all the children who died uh, in the Holocaust. And the tree represents the tree that Anne Frank talks about, being able to look at trees in her diary. I'll also mention that to, to the writer of the photograph, uh, you may know there's Joe Malone's, uh, which had been uh, at both the town watch house, the kind of full run of the police station, and also a, a mortuary. Now, coming back to the river, the river was all important. I say it was the boundary between uh, Wessex and Mercia. And there was a medieval bridge, uh, a very old bridge, uh, at the base of which can be seen the undercroft of St. Louis, no, John Lewis, uh, which is opened up again at the Heritage Weekend in September. But this was the only bridge west of London until Putney Bridge was built in 1729. So this again shows the importance of Kingston. Uh, the current bridge uh, was uh, built to replace the medieval bridge uh, in 1828. And then it was enlarged every 90 years roughly because um, there was a second extension uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, just before the First World War, uh, because of increased traffic, and then again at the beginning of the new millennium, uh, because of again more traffic congestion uh, crossing the river. And if you look under the bridge, you'll see quite clearly, you can just about make out, uh, even from the photograph, there are three distinct sections uh, of the bridge that you can see under the arches. Now, the medieval bridge plays a part in English history. Um, Mary Tudor, uh, the, she was the eldest child of Henry VIII, you may remember. She came to the throne in 1553. Uh, she was a staunch Roman Catholic uh, at a time when uh, England had just become Protestant. Uh, people were prepared to tolerate her when she decided to marry the Spanish uh, King Philip of Spain, uh, people didn't like this. And so there was a rebellion led by a man called Wyatt, who came from Kent and decided that he would attack London, not the, from the obvious route, because they'd be waiting from him uh, from the east. So he came south through Kingston, intended to go into London from the west. But when he got to Kingston, <clears throat> the citizens were loyal to the Queen, so they cut down the bridge so he couldn't cross. He had to uh, waste time uh, rebuilding it. Uh, it was only a timber bridge to get it up again. And by the time he and his troops got into London, of course, uh, Mary's army were waiting for him. So Mary rewarded the town with an extra fish where to fund the repairs and more market days. So um, the town was not necessarily totally Catholic, but certainly loyal to the crown. Now, alongside the river, of course, there are the riverside pubs, there's the gazebo and the bishop, which used to be called the bishop out of residence. Now, why is that? Um, there was a bishop's palace here, uh, William of Wickham, uh, whose picture there is on the right. On the left, you see the sign, which you'll recognize. If you're interested in William of Wickham, I have in fact written an article uh, for the latest uh, edition of the Salmon magazine about William of Wickham. I'm not quite sure when that will be published. Uh, but he was um, not only a man of religion, but very much the right hand man of two kings, Edward III, who I've mentioned, and Richard II. And he had a palace at Esher and other in London. And some people think he didn't live in the one in Kingston, which is why it used to be called the Bishop out of Residence. There is, of course, the railway bridge. Uh, but interestingly, Kingston was very much opposed to the coming of the railway, uh, largely because of the coaching industry. I've mentioned how successful that was. 
they saw quite rightly the railway as a threat and were very resistant to it. Um, the rather ugly pipes you see uh, date back to uh, the early period when the National Guano Company would transport the produce across the river. But back to the railways themselves, because of the resistance from Kingston proper, uh, there was another little town about three miles away, developing into a Victorian suburb, which was then called Kingston upon Railway. That, of course, is Surbiton, uh, which rather than being Kingston upon Thames, was Kingston upon Railway, and to this day has a better, uh, more regular rail service into Waterloo than we do. <laughs> and perhaps that's a, a little bit of revenge because we in Kingston didn't want a railway initially. Um, but this whole area, of course, has been hugely regenerated recently. Back in the, the 1960s, uh, before I lived in, in uh, Kingston, uh, Kingston was said to have seven deadly smells, uh, like the seven Saxon kings, because of the boatyards, brewing, tanneries, chandlers, malting, linseed oil, and sewers. And so right through to the 1960s, the riverside area was not very pleasant. But Charter Quay, now, of course, uh, very much like a European sort of piazza atmosphere. And if you go to the little coffee shop in the centre there, you'll see timbers from the Castle Inn, uh, one of the, the pubs that I mentioned uh, in the marketplace. Uh, the Clatton Bridge, uh, coming back uh, from uh, the riverside uh, into uh, Kingston proper, this crosses the Hogs Mill. And the Clatton Bridge was so called because of the clattering hooves uh, crossing it. But it was also at the site of the ducking stool. Now, I mentioned punishments in the marketplace. There was one punishment uh, that, was, uh, that took place over the river. Uh, there's a picture of a ducking stool. Now, uh, I always have to be careful when I talk about this. My wife gets very cross with me. But this, of course, was a punishment only for women and for women who talk too much, <clears throat> nag their husbands, and they would be ducked down uh, into the river and then pulled up again. They, they weren't left to drown. Uh, it was just to teach them a lesson. Uh, across from Clapham Bridge is, of course, the Guild Hall. As I say, that was completed in, in 1935. A lot of connections uh, with the river. Uh, the weather vane at the top is, is a barge. On the Art Deco door, they're, they're horses a barge and goods. It's very much uh, showing that the economy of the town uh, had depended uh, on the river. Uh, there's a, an Art Deco lady with hair flowing like the Thames. Uh, they're the three fish uh, of Kingston. There's also um, the Fasces. Uh, this is the Latin term uh, for the, um, um, the, the bundle of rods which symbolized law and order. And of course, until quite recently, this was the, the center for the, the magistrates' courts. But of course, ironically, in the 1930s, the Fasces, it was exactly the same symbol uh, that Mussolini had used, uh, hence the name Fascisti. And inside you get your Queen Anne connections. There's the Queen Anne suite uh, and a wonderful portrait of the Queen herself. At the Rose Theatre is our, our newest site in Kingston, uh, a replica of the Elizabethan Theatre, uh, which uh, the modern one opened in, in January 2008. Uh, sadly, been of course closed recently because of the pandemic, but can seat uh, almost 900 people. Edward Mybridge, another Kingston character. Um, I'm not sure you can see all of that. Uh, but, uh, Sorry, I'm just trying to just go back. Never mind. Anyway, Edward Mybridge was a, a famous photographer who, who was born and then died in, in Kingston. Uh, he invented something called the Zoe Praxiscope, uh, which is a kind of moving uh, pictures, uh, the sort of origin uh, of the, the, or the forerunner of, of the cine camera. Uh, a former mayor used to de describe Kingston as being the sort of forerunner of Hollywood. Uh, because of Mybridge's invention. Uh, and there was great celebration of him just a couple of years ago, uh, you may have seen in Kingston. 
Another Kingston character, Caesar Picton, there is a, a blue plaque for him. He's very much a rags to riches story. Uh, he came to England from Senegal, uh, probably as a slave, but very quickly freed, and he became very rich. Uh, he ended his life as a prosperous coal merchant. And you can see uh, a plaque for him in, in the church as well. These days, of course, Kingston is perhaps most famous for shopping. You've got Bentles, you've got John Lewis, uh, Clarence Street, uh, the thoroughfare for the shopping, Eden Street, and new developments being planned still. And ending as I began with the marketplace. Um, a great deal of money has been spent on recent refurbishment and more market stalls, all the pop-ups, a greater variety. It's now open seven days a week, which it used not to be, but it's still very much, I'd say, the vital centre of our town. It's both a historic centre, it's an economic centre, and it's a social centre. Uh, another uh, royal connection for you, King Charles I, who famously lost his head uh, in the Civil War against the Roundheads, he granted a mon monopoly uh, to the town. No other town within a radius of uh, seven miles uh, could hold uh, a market. And to this day, it, when Ham holds its markets, they have to apply to Kingston Council uh, for permission. But that certainly uh, added to the economy of the town and, and ensured, I think, the fact that Kingston Market has survived so well right through to the 21st century. A century ago, of course, cinema was all the rage and the early decades of the 20th century saw the rise of several cinemas, uh, which were very popular. Uh, now sort of all concentrated under one roof at Rotunda. Another start of the 20th century, uh, Nipper came to live in Kingston, you know, the symbol of his master's voice, uh, Lloyd's Bank in Clarence Street. Uh, you can see a plaque there where Nipper lived, uh, and behind there's Nipper Alley, uh, so named in 2010 to commemorate when Nipper used to go to uh, do his business. And of course, the famous telephone boxes at London Road, uh, which was the main artery from London to Portsmouth, are uh, out of order. Uh, this was the road for the police station, the fire station, also Cleves Arms Houses. And at the end of the road, you've got both Kingston Grammar and Tipping Boys School. There's Lufkin Chapel, which I mentioned uh, uh, early on, <coughs> excuse me, uh, well worth um, looking at from the outside. and. That's open to her by uh, Kingston uh, grammar uh, for weddings and other things. And there's a history to that I've not got time uh, to go into. So I've gone through the ages, uh, through the centuries. There's another depiction of Atherston and, and another picture of uh, the Queen and the late Prince Philip in, in Kingston Market uh, quite a few years back. But I thought it was quite good to get the royal couple in our famous uh, market. And finally, if I may, uh, as part of the Kingston Guides, we've often put on pageants, and there is our pageant from uh, three years ago, uh, depicting many of the historical characters. There's Atherston, King Charles, there's Queen Elizabeth, uh, various others, and uh, there was the then mayor and deputy mayor as well. Well, thank you very much for listening. I, I think I rather overrun my time, uh, but uh, I hope that was that was interest to you and. Uh, give you something to think about when you next visit the centre of Kingston. Thank you very much.